Well, thank you. Look at this guy here. This is the face of a hookworm. Now, how can anything with a face like that possibly be good for you? Now, most of us in the developed world, like regions of the world like Australasia, uh, the US or Europe, mostly learn about parasitic worms from giving our pets deworming medications or also maybe the uh, uh, common but fairly harmless pinworm that infects mostly children and causes an itchy bum. But in, in tropical developing countries, like in Africa, Southeast Asia or South America, parasitic worms are an enormous health problem and causing a range of debilitating symptoms. They can feed on your blood and make you anemic. They can cause intestinal obstruction. They can impair childhood development and may even cause death. Now, some of these worms include uh, roundworms, like a friend up there, the hookworm. But there's also things like tapeworms, which you may have heard of. And they can grow up to meters and meters long and live in your intestine. There's also flatworms, like schistosomes, and they're a deadly parasite. Now, it's estimated around 2 billion people around the world are infected with parasitic worms. And that's around a third of the Earth's population. And currently, there are no vaccines to protect a human against any parasitic worm species. And it continues to remain the holy grail for researchers who work in my field. But believe it or not, I didn't always grow up wanting to dedicate my career to studying parasitic worms that live in your intestine. But, but I did realize pretty early on that becoming an immunologist, as is someone who studies the immune system and how it uh, works in health and in disease, was a great opportunity to make a difference in the world and potentially discover something that could be used to improve human health. So our immune system is obviously very important. It protects us from infections with nasty bacteria, viruses, parasites. And it can be trained with vaccination. However, it's increasingly clear that our immune system is actually the culprit in a range of other diseases like asthma, and allergy, uh, arthritis, diabetes. And this is where the immune system becomes out of balance and starts, uh, uh, loses control and starts attacking things that it shouldn't, like the food we eat or the air we breathe or our own cells and our own tissues, causing a range of diseases. Now, my specific research career when I did my PhD was trying to understand how the, the immune system protects us against parasitic worms, in this case, a hookworm, like the one pictured below, behind me. But I and others who work in this field, studying immune responses to hookworms and trying to develop vaccines, fairly quickly realized that these worms are absolute masters at controlling the immune system for their own benefit. And this is kind of an illustration about how much we're up against it if we ever want to rid the world of hookworms. It shows the infection intensity with various hook, uh, parasite species with age. And as you can see, while infections with flatworms and whipworms peak in early life, in childhood or adolescence, and they gradually decline. And this is indica indicating that our immune system may have dealt and adapted to control these parasites. But this is in stark contrast to what you see with hookworm infections. That line just keeps going up. Often the elderly in the pop uh, population have the highest worm beds. It really suggests that the human immune system does not uh, develop a way to control these infections. And in many ways, hookworms that I work on are about as resilient as it gets. So we've established that hookworms and other worms are a global menace. Now, hookworms in particular, they're a bloodthirsty parasite. They attach to your intestinal wall and they suck your blood. They're like little vampires. Furthermore, they suppress the immune system, which is really good for them because they can live for years happily. However, this immune suppression has unwanted side effects. For example, it can make you more susceptible to infections with nasty viruses and bacteria like HIV or tuberculosis. Also, this immune suppression might make you less, uh, less able to be vaccinated against a range of other diseases. So if you think back to the title of my presentation today, Worming Away to Good Health, how can they possibly be good for you? And why, in some regions of the world, are people who live in places of the world like Australia actively going out and trying to become infected with parasitic worms? It's obviously uh, it's pretty difficult to explain. However, there may be a rational explanation for this, and it may be based on where in the world you live, what other ailments you might have, and how many worms you're actually infected with. So I mentioned before some of these autoimmune or inflammatory diseases that are becoming actually quite an epidemic in the developed world, 
including countries, on, as you can see up here, like Australia, Europe, and the US. And these diseases range from asthma to food allergies to inflammatory bowel diseases. And it just so happens these diseases are most common in regions of the world where there are no worm infections, where they've been largely eradicated. And conversely, regions of the world where worms are most prevalent, there's very little incidence of, of these autoimmune diseases. And this provoked a hypothesis a number of years ago that somehow these worms can protect us against these inflammatory diseases. Or conversely, their eradication from the developed world might have contributed to the rise in these inflammatory diseases. So an idea was conceived that our bodies are just another ecosystem, where the health of this ecosystem is dependent on the range of different things, for example, and deliberately changing this ecosystem by controlled exposure to parasites may be one novel way of treating inflammatory diseases. So, for example, about 10 years ago, uh, this idea was pioneered by uh, researchers like Dr. John Cruz from Brisbane, Australia, as well as Dr. Joel Weinstock from the US. And in these clinical trials, they deliberately exposed people to either hookworm larvae, as you can see on the left, or eggs of the pig whipworm, Trichurus. In these trials, they did it in people with inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. Now, our intestinal, our intestinal tract should look like something on the left in health. It should be smooth, it should be relatively free of tissue damage. But inflammatory bowel disease, it looks like the picture on the right. There's evidence of severe inflammation and tissue damage, and that causes a range of debilitating symptoms for these people, and there is no real adequate cure. But in these trials done 10 years ago, they showed that this either exposure to hookworms or whipworms did tend to reduce the severity of inflammatory bowel disease, which is really encouraging. Subsequently, these so-called worm therapy trials have been tried for a number of different diseases, including asthma, autism, multiple sclerosis, and uh, ulcerative colitis, with fairly mixed results, depending on the trial. And it may suggest that, I guess, worm therapy may not be for everyone. But the promise of these trials suggests that, that more work should be done in this area. And in recent years, we did such a trial. We did it in people with celiac disease, which, for those of you who don't know, is a disease which infects the intestine when people eat gluten-containing foods, such as breads, pastas, pizza, beer. Now, in these people, they bravely consented to be infected with 20 hookworm larvae, which were applied to the skin, just as you saw in that video. So these 20 larvae were put onto the skin, and that's where they begin their interesting journey into the body. They actively burrow through your skin, and they make their way into your blood. They travel around the blood and make their way to your lungs. Then they wriggle up and down through your digestive system, where they reach their final home in your intestine. And in this trial, we then deliberately exposed people to gluten as spaghetti. We started at a very low level. These are not worms. <laughs> we started at a very low level, like this two-centimeter spaghetti straw, which you can see in the bowl on the left. But we know that this amount of spaghetti does contain enough gluten to make people sick, some people with celiac disease. But in our clinical trial, we were quite surprised that by the end of the trial, the people who had the hookworms on board, were consuming a medium bowl of pasta every day with very little ill effects, with no ill effects. And this was quite fascinating to us, suggesting that somehow the worm is uh, protecting them or developing tolerance to gluten ingestion in these people who normally could not eat gluten and were on a gluten-free diet. And at the end of the trial, all these participants were offered a pill to cure their, uh, cure their worm infections and get rid of their worms. But all of the people declined. They wanted to keep their worms. And it said something about maybe, you know, in low numbers, these parasites may be uh, safe and well tolerated. So here's a short but a little bit graphic video, but this is a video of an endoscopy of one of the trial participants at the end, and it nicely shows two adult worms living in the upper small intestine. Now, the larger worm on top, that's the female, but it's, it's one centimetre long, so this is a, they're actually quite small. But she's filled with blood, so she's just had a meal. And the smaller, smaller worm underneath it there, that's the male, and he's trying to mate, mate with her. And I think it's quite amazing that these one centimetre long worms can pump out ten, the females can pump out tens of thousands of eggs every day, and they're released. But these people were infected. If they're sensible and they use toilets, then there's no risk of transmission to the greater, wider community or reinfecting themselves. 
So I guess this bring, brings us back to the central idea for my talk. There's some sort of a Jekyll and a Hyde component to worm infections, depending on the context. So obviously, infections with hundreds, if not thousands of worms is bad for you, especially these people who are already malnourished, or they may have con uh, some sort of complicating infection that can co obviously exacerbate disease. But some of these trials suggest that maybe some parasites, if given in low numbers, are fairly well tolerated and they're safe, and they may actually be beneficial in some contexts. Now, I think it's amazing that these two seemingly distinct concepts, like parasitic worm infections and human inflammatory diseases, are actually quite closely linked. And it really suggests the power that worms have had in the evolution of our immune system. And for me as a scientist, being able to witness firsthand the discovery of quite an extraordinary thing in everyday life that could potentially better human health, make being a scientist and immunologist such a great job. But where does this leave us with worm therapy? Now, how would you feel if a doctor wanted to put some parasite larvae on your skin to cure your disease and you could feel them burrowing through? Or how would you feel if they gave you a cup of parasite eggs and asked you to swallow it? Now, a lot of you would say no, and I've thought a lot about it, and I don't know what I think about it. But then again, I don't have a chronic inflammatory disease. I mean, there are people out there with these, some of these conditions, there is no adequate cure, and they've tried conventional treatments, and they just don't work. And if something like this could cure them, their, their disease or help them in any way, then you can perhaps understand the mentality of why they would infect themselves with hookworms. But researchers such as myself or clinicians around the world are not necessarily wanting to go around infecting people with live worms. Now, it may be a little bit risky, and it probably is not acceptable to the wider community in the long run. But what we are trying to do, and others around the world are trying to understand, is what these worms do to our immune system. And specifically, do they release a specific factor or a molecule that interacts with our immune system that can, could be produced as a medication and included as a pill that could have the same effect as the live worm? And we feel that this sort of worm molecule treatment would be more acceptable and marketable to the wider community and could conceivably be used to treat a range of inflammatory diseases, not just celiac disease. And I thank you.